everybody, welcome to the first episode of the Rogecast. This is going to be a Magic the Gathering podcast. And let me introduce my first guests. First, from uh, RogueDeckBuilder.com and RogueDeckBuilder on YouTube, and also GatheringMagic.com, we have Kevin. Howdy. <laughs> Exciting intro. And <laughs> from MTGOStrat.com and Magic the Gathering, MagicGatheringStrat.com. Dot com on YouTube, we have Dan Herning. Hello. Did I butcher your name? No, that's actually really good. No, oh, I will try harder next time. All right, uh, Kevin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I've been doing YouTube for for a year now. Uh, so right for well, I guess do videos for GatheringMagic.com, and I guess my YouTube channel is Rogue Deck Builder earlier and it's the it is on building more of the Johnny type decks, the creative decks, the out of the box decks, not the not the net decks. So kinda of got a niche just I, I the channel started when I was so excited doing a deck uh, that I called Dork Play that used a bunch of mana door and all the blades from the Meriden Scars of Meriden block. And it was doing very well. I was winning a dailies and as my I just decided to make a video and it took off oh there you and now oh no I lost you there for a second <laughs> hear me now yeah, yeah I can hear you now yeah, okay I don't know what cut out or what not. So. <laughs> uh, it was just like the last five seconds for me. I don't know if it cut out for Dan too. I heard uh, dorks and blades. I'm done this one. <laughs> what? I heard dorks and blades. Oh yeah, well, th yeah. That that was just the introduction of how my channel got started. I just I wanted to do a video. I was a big fan of Frank Lepore. Uh He did a YouTube. I think he's moved over to just TCG Player. He doesn't do YouTube videos anymore. But I used to love watching his YouTube videos. And at the time, I just had a very successful deck that was out of the box thinking. I thought I'd just make a video and see how it went. And it was received pretty well by the YouTube community. And then I got lucky on some other videos like Epic Experiment. They got pretty popular. And I just decided to do videos ever since, you know, start a, uh, a channel that's focused on rogue deck, you know, rogue deck brewing. And yeah, so got my Gathering Magic sponsorship back in March of last year. And so that's really helped out as well, since I've got a, a platform there to uh, do videos on. Yeah, I think the, the first video I saw of you was actually uh, the Epic Experiment deck, because I was looking for somebody who had a brew involving it, because I love the card so much. Uh, so that was, that was the first video I saw of you. Yeah, it's one of the first ones. Yeah, like I said, the only other video series before that was the, the Dork Blade, and which has since been taken down, because I had... Uh, copyrighted music and you know all those things that YouTube does not appreciate. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. come a long way since then. <laughs> now, wasn't the uh, Rogue Market a little bit before uh, the Epic Experiment deck? Or? I probably did do some Rogue Market. Like I said, there's some videos that have been taken down. So, if you looked at my history of my channel, that probably is the Rogue Market. Probably is the first video that's up. But there was a video series before that that was taken down. Uh, that's a shame. YouTube always. Uh... I took it well. I took it down for precautionary reasons. I didn't understand YouTube at the time, and I didn't. Ex I didn't expect the channel to take off. The Epic Experiment deck was quite popular. I mean, the Dork Blade videos only got a couple hundred views before they started to die out. So, but the Epic Experiment really took off. I, I really think that there are other people just like you that were trying to, you know, find a deck that utilized Epic Experiment. I'd had some success at F and M with that deck, and thought I'd do a video series on that as well. And we all appreciate it, believe me. Thanks. And now, Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I started a YouTube channel uh, exactly a year ago. And it's called Magic Gathering Strat. Uh, it started out with me doing mostly pauper videos. But uh, I have uh, let an, a lot of other people do videos on the channel. I'm looking for a standard video maker right now. So if anybody listens to this, please contact me. Uh, we have about 12 people doing videos uh, on the channel right now. And uh, after I've done that for about you know, five days, <laughs> I was approached by a guy called Will Scarangello, who asked me to 
start a site with him. So mtgeostrat.com is uh, me and Will's site. It has about the same profile. So we try to do everything about magic. We started out in pauper, so it, we have mostly pauper people from the start, but uh, it is growing and uh, we're trying to cover everything. So we are very general. Yeah, that's how I uh, how I found you was uh, the popper videos because uh, uh, my fascination uh, with budget decks and how they can compete with regular decks that cost like ten times more. Um, was it was it trinket even? Um, no, it was the popper gauntlet. It was the love train one. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, one one advantage with Pauper is that it's very easy to build a lot of decks. Mm -hmm. So what I did last summer for the first season of the Pauper Gauntlet was to uh, play 49, 47 different decks in the tournament practice room and try to survive as long as possible. And it turned out to be quite uh, popular. It was uh, it turned my entire play of Magic much more casual. Uh, when I started the YouTube channel, the intention was to become a better tournament player, but now I don't uh, play tournaments at all. <laughs> it's all casual, <laughs> pretty much. Well, popper tournaments are a thing of the past. Yeah. From what I hear. Uh, yeah, there, there are some premier events, but popper was never very competitive to start with. I think it, the advantages of the format is uh, that it's so great for casual, and that you can build all these decks and sort of learn the principles of magic uh, without paying thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's uh, that, I mean that's that's a big part of magic, and I don't I don't think you have to spend a lot of money to, to have a competitive deck. Um, I remember a video of Brennan I think uh, where he accidentally in the just for fun room played with his popper deck against a modern deck, <laughs> and he actually held his own. That was <laughs> that was pretty incredible. <laughs> Sweet. I've um, been doing a lot of modern lately, so I just actually bought Jund. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a thousand bucks, pretty much. So yeah, for the Modern Noob series, which I am also. Playing. I like Eternal formats. Yeah, Modern Noob is a series I'm doing right now when I'm uh, playing uh, and learning the format and playing five different decks. So I, it, that's very few for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now I don't even have to ask you this, Kevin, but um, do you play more rogue decks or net decks? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I I have a. I play a lot more rogue decks. I will play the occasional um, tier one decks at larger tournaments and whatnot, but usually I even spice those up. It's very hard for me to play an established deck because the what I get out of Magic is is the the creativity aspect. Like the most fun I get is actually brewing decks and then playing those brews against competitive decks. I don't feel as as fulfilled, I guess, by playing in a tier one deck at a tournament and winning. It just feels like it's someone else's accomplishment. And I mean, I'm not I'm not against net decking, but for me personally, I just like to brew my own decks and play those those decks. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the the originality and creativity aspect is really a a big part of what fascinates me in in Magic. And uh, to be honest, I am kind of against net decks, but we'll get on that later. Um, Dan, how about you? More rogue or more net deck? Well, I don't brew at all. Uh, I, that was a decision I made is, uh, earlier uh, in the sh history of the YouTube channel. So, and that has made me a very good person for a lot of brewers. So, for example, in the Gauntlet, I, there was a brewer for every deck. Uh, so I, I talked to a lot of brewers and I play their decks. Uh, and of course, it's more fun to play rogue decks and uh, it's definitely more interesting for the YouTube audience. So, uh, yeah, for, for for example, for, if I post a Delver versus Stompy to tier one decks uh, video, then uh, uh, it's it's interesting. But if I post a post uh, Pauper Pink Pants versus Delver, then yeah, <laughs> the views shoot through the roof. So yeah. it's the curiosity also of uh, Pink Pants. Yes. What, is this? <laughs> what yep. sorcery is this? A um, love train. <laughs> yeah, love train. Yeah. Actually, the Great name tech. is what caught my attention. I was like, Love Train, I wonder what this is all about. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, I early decided that the naming principle got to be whatever the brewer says the deck is called, mm -hmm. that's what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
and that has caused some uh, controversy and also piques a lot of interest with uh, imaginative names like Love Train. Yeah, well, I, it, it usually does. Um, now, do you then do you play any Magic: The Gathering tournaments on, like on paper or FNMs or anything anymore? Actually, in the fall of 2012, I went to my local game store and I played a draft. And that was my first paper tournament since Pro Tour Los Angeles mm -hmm. in 2000. Wow. <laughs> and I haven't played paper since then. So once, uh, once in 14 years. Oh, wow. Don't you miss it at all? Do you just prefer No, no, I hate you know? uh, all the overhead, the traveling, uh, sorting cards. <laughs> I still have a... A full bookcase with cards. <laughs> <laughs> so you prefer just to play MTGO with your little mug of coffee next to you, huh? Yes. <laughs> no pants uh, <laughs> at home. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you don't have to wear pants at an FNM, but I take your point. Um, <laughs> it, it is uh, preferred. Uh, I have had things called to me. Um, how about you, Kevin? Any tournaments, FNMs lately? I just got back from uh, PTQ, uh, this would be Fort Collins, so in Colorado. Uh, it was an eight-hour drive. So I was, I'm a little bit groggy right now. I just barely got back about an hour ago uh, from that. And, well, paper, paper and MTGO have different roles in my life. I like MTGO for the competition, and it is, it's so much easier to brew on MTGO than try to find paper cards. And then... It, Rares are so cheap, uncommons are so cheap, and you can get them. One of my problems is that even when I was in a more metropolitan area is, uh, uh, or metropolis area was uh, I couldn't even find uncommons sometimes. I'd go to different stores and couldn't find an uncommon. It'd be forever to just build a deck before I could even test it. With MTGO, you can go to one of the million bots and buy the cards and sit down and, and start testing immediately. So it takes down that time factor. Uh, exponentially, so uh, that's what I get out of MTGO is more of the competition. But I am a social person, so I do like paper. I do like, uh, you know, the friendly. I, I went with with three other friends. We, you know, drove, and that was that was part of the fun was was getting in the van and driving eight hours to to an event. But I am <laughs> a bit exhausted from it because it was it was grinding, and it is it is a bit, little bit difficult having to actually deal with personalities. You know, you don't have to see people on MTGO. Mm -hmm. And you can avoid them. You don't have to have any sort of social interaction. And it can get quite weird in the magic community and paper to deal with some of the, uh, I guess, tougher personalities or the personalities that are harder to get along with. Ran into a little bit of that uh, during Colorado. But the great thing about Colorado is they just legalize marijuana. So everyone is <laughs> so chill there. I mean, it was, it was the great – coming from Utah, a very uptight state – to Colorado, and they are having a heyday out there with the, the new legalization, so it's a pretty so, interesting so every, tournament. Every game went to time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am taking notes now, Colorado, for no specific reason. <laughs> Colorado. Okay, road trip. Um, that, that explains why my poker man, uh, my poker, <laughs> my magic mentor, Power T, he spent uh, like several years in Colorado, and now I understand why. <laughs> Well, if they just legalized it, then he may have left too early. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a month ago. I think it was only about a month ago that they did legalize it. But I mean, Colorado is huge for I magic. I assume they weren't too uh, fascistic about it right before they legalized it. So they were probably tolerant before as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it usually happens. Um, <clears throat> so you want to tell us like a sneak peek of how that went or uh... – Oh sure, yeah. It, it's I, I definitely need to get back into the competitive aspect of Magic. I am I am very rusty. Um, it, it didn't go well for me. I ended up going. I ended up playing out. I I was statistically eliminated by round five, but I, I decided to play the the rest of it out. And it, it <laughs> I got all the matchups I even wanted, and I just couldn't. My it was more my my deck was a little bit awkward. I would not suggest running a three color deck right now. Uh, you just get blown out of the water by missing a certain color. I was running junk mid-range, and it was kind of my own little flavor of it. I wanted to kind of take Esper mid-range route where they put early threats and then follow them up by you know later game threats. So I was running Soldier of the Pantheons and Drive Militants that then curved into Voices, Locks and Smiters, 
uh, and then into Opsidot. And then I had the Blood Barons in the sideboard, tons of removal and, and whatnot. And so, I, like I said, I got the matchups I wanted. It was just a lot of times I was stuck on on two colors, not having the third one or not having the double black for Opsidot or the double, double green for Abbott the Worm. And those type of things cost me a lot of games. And then there was a lot of just the luck factor in there where – like one of the, the scenarios that really sticks out in my mind was I first turned Thought Seized, my opponent who was playing RG Monsters, and who keeps a hand with with five lands, a Sylvan Keratin, and an Elvish Mystic? I mean, that, that's the handicap. A smart player like, who doesn't want to get Thought Seized. I guess so, yeah. So <laughs> so I, I end up taking a Sylvan ter- Keratin, thinking, okay, the Sylvan Keratin at least can fix his, his lands. I think he had one Temple in his hands. So I'm like, eh, double red for... Um, the Stormbred Dragon, he won't be able to, if he tops into that, he won't be able to cast. So take the Sylvan Keratid, plus it stops any sort of uh, Soldier of Pantheons or whatnot. So anyway, he, he proceeds to top deck into Domri and finds Apollo Kronos off the top, off his first Domri trigger, then I have to waste two Celestia Charms to uh, kind of power through my Loxen and Smiter to kill the Domri, and then he proceeds to hit every time with Domri. So it's just one of those times that, ugh, all right, <laughs> useless thought sees. First, and then they have the answers on top, and that's just kind of how my day went. Uh, Boros, another Boros match was similar, where I thought sees first turn and found it, you know, chain of the rocks and a magma jet, and then then he, he draws into Ash Zealot, hammer hammer of Perforos, storm breath dragon, and then just proceeds to have all the answers. So a little bit frustrating that, like I had the mat, like not the the worst part about the entire thing is I I didn't get any matchups where I felt like were unwinnable. I actually got all matchups that were favorable for my for my deck. I was worried about Mono Blue, didn't see it once. And I was re- the deck was really prepared for Esper Midrange and UWR Control, which I thought would be everywhere because of the popularity of Mono Black and Mono Blue. Mm-hmm. And I did see that twice, and I was able to, to easily win those matches, but everything else was not going my way there. So ended up at 3-5, and five, so pretty disappointed in that, but... It's my second PTQ ever, actually. I mean, I won the very first PTQ I was ever in, so this is still... I'm still growing as a player. I'm not the best player ever, so... Yeah, that, that was the one with the uh, Soul Sisters, was it not? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I still love that deck. I just built this... it, finished building it recently. <laughs> it's so yeah, it's fun. a fun deck. Yeah. This uh, was huge, too. This this uh, PTQ was over 215, I believe. It was massive PTQ for... Wow. Um, a little town. I mean, I think Fort Collins, Colorado, is only about a hundred thousand people. Oh, wow. So it's oh, it's pretty. It was huge for that. I mean, Denver is only an hour away though, so yeah, yeah. everyone traveled in probably. Yeah. Um. Okay. So we were talking about net decks earlier. You were saying you don't have a problem with it. Um. I kind of do because it it seems that people nowadays are more about efficiency and not so much originality and and fun and I think that takes away a lot of the magic, pardon the pun, in of the game. Um, so I, 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 I I'm I'm kind of against all the everybody running mono blue devotion mono black devotion. It's like it would be like a society where everybody wears uniforms. You know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be as much fun. It's very hard to do anything about. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, when I started playing uh, back in the Viking Age in '94, uh, <laughs> uh, Revised had just come out, <laughs> and uh, I was the only one with internet access, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which was great. <laughs> so uh, you could see every every week you went to the local game store and people. Where just, that was the meta game. There was no outside influence, and it was the best magic I ever played. It was so much fun. But net decking is there, and there's nothing we can do about it, really. Yeah, I guess I guess internet has a big influence in that because uh, when I, I I first played the game, it wasn't quite as early. It was Kamigawa, uh, but still, most people I knew made their own crazy brews and. You just never knew what to expect. I mean, what is this guy going to be running? You know, is he going to be the the overblaze Hidetsugu combo or, or or something else? You never knew. Didn't everybody run Affinity? Uh, a couple people did, but in my area there was a lot of originality. I I would, I would say it was people running the demon. Uh, what was it called? Uh, 
It was the the intro pack, the black red one. Uh, anyway, it was something like at the end of your turn, if you don't have a demon, you sacrifice a shaman or something. It was pretty in insane. But if you had both on board, it would be crazy value. I can't remember the name of the cards. It's I, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast. Um, so as a creative player, Kevin, um, why don't you hate net decking? <laughs> Well, to each his own. I, I mean, I, I, I really love personality theory, so I understand like how a person, in at least in in United States, we have uh, the personalities here are very aren't very creative. We have a lot of people that are good at at performing a certain duty, not really looking outside the box. So, I, you know, I've grown up around people that, uh, I mean, I, I see the influence, especially in this area with magic, where they they want to be efficient, they want to play the best strategy possible. And it's very uncomfortable for them to think outside the box. So I'm, I'm okay with that. The only problem that I have right now with the kind of spike mentality is where you go to these, these tournaments and they feel like you don't deserve to be there unless you're running a, a net deck. Mm -hmm. Or it's, it's kind of this unwritten law. And it takes away a huge, like you said, fun part aspect of the game, which is, which is brewing, finding different combinations and, and whatnot. And I, I wish more people would jump on the, the more rogue or Johnny bandwagon rather than the spike net deck bandwagon because it does get very boring when i've been to tournaments like delver was the when i won um or when i top 16 a star city open i played delver seven times in a row and it was just like am i going to see anything but delver today and it was what well, was in my favor because i was playing a thalia deck mm -hmm. but it was just still it just got so annoying where and those those games were really decided by turn one. You knew if you won or not. If they, they if they had to have the like turn one gut shot or or mental misstep to counter your birds of paradise or or a same thing the gut shot the Thalia down by turn two or otherwise you're just gonna be way far ahead and and it wasn't it was almost like the, okay let's show each other each other's opening hand and decide who wins there. So <laughs> it, that's how the games played out and it was just uh, over and over and over that. Delver, 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 Delver. Why can't can't they just play another deck besides Delver? <laughs> and especially when when like right now, I guess right now is not quite as healthy of, of a format as the Innistrad Return to Ravnica block or uh, standard was, but it's still healthy enough that I think there are plenty of decks out there that are viable. And I guess we did at this this PTQ. I was impressed because I, I saw a ton of different decks. I I expected to see mono black all day long and didn't even see it once. But then again, I was kind of on the on the, the loser's bracket at that point. Well, so I don't know. It's <laughs> Yeah, to each his own. That's If people want a net deck, if they're there to win, that's fine with me. It's just they, they, that is the major problem I have with Spikes and one of the major reasons that I started Rogue Deck Builder was, it, was to be a voice for the people that actually do like to brew. Because there is that. And I know that the, the there is the whole anti-spike hatred you see that online too like like i've seen it at tournaments too like uh if you get beat by a net deck then i i've seen you know the the johnny players start raging and be like oh you're a stupid net deck if you create your own deck i mean it goes both ways but my experience is i've had a ton of of the more competitive players more of the net deck players get very, very angry with me when i play a rogue deck at a tournament that's why i've got a collection of screenshots from mtgo about all the times they've you know, raged at me for for playing a, a rogue deck. Oh, yeah, but well, why would anybody on rage on that? It's <laughs> like if everybody, if if you were the only one playing net decks and everybody was playing rogue decks, then you should be happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Pat Chapin, uh, Chapin said it best that if you if you never play net decks, you have no brain. But if you never play rogue decks, you have no heart. Yeah. Yeah, that's really really well put. Um, I also want to add that um, two formats I recommend a lot if you like uh, rogue decks and uh, building decks is uh, Standard Pauper and Heirloom. Uh, we are doing the Standard Pauper Gauntlet on Magic Adding Strat in February and we will uh, call for decks on the 24th of February. So uh, we're looking for brewers. Uh, it will be on MTGO Strat. Uh, Heirloom in itself, I don't know if you know anything about the format. But Heirloom is like the, the most open brewer format there is in Magic. And it's very, very deep. Mm -hmm. Do you know about formats? 
I know a little. I, I've I've uh, I've tried a few. I tried Popper for a while. I kind of got sick of Popper because again, all I did was was uh, played Mono Blue Delver like ten times yeah. in a row, and then Heirloom's it just got far more open and uh, has more power as you can use rare and mythics. Uh, yeah. Actually, the card I think it has almost the biggest card pool except for Legacy and Vintage. Then uh, Heirloom is uh, all the cheap cards pretty much. Uh, so you, cards rotate in and out based on price. So if a deck gets popular in theory, then the price will go up on some cards, and then they will be banned for a month. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a very interesting brewer's format. Yeah, you always have to keep up to date, it seems, with... Uh, I mean, oh, I can use Nightville Spectre. Oh, no, it just skyrocketed. Oh, I have to rebuild yes. my deck. <laughs> you can find uh, more details on Heirloom and the tournament on gathering.com. I will also put that in the description below. Yep. Um, <clears throat> now, that that also brings me to a point. Uh, Kevin, your Bug Immortal Servitude deck got somewhat popular out there, wouldn't you say? Well, L yeah, LSV did a daily MTG on the, you know, the Mothership site about it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it got pretty popular on Reddit as well and a few other... Yeah, it was. It's probably the most competitive deck, I would say that I've brewed. I mean, the most complete, the one that actually worked. It's been one of my favorites. It's just very fun to play as well. So I think it it was kind of the perfect storm. It had the the competitive edge and was still a combo deck, a rogue type deck. So I, I enjoyed it. I was very sad to see Innistrad rotate. And yet they never even mentioned you, the original brewer. <laughs> That's okay. That's uh, I know. And then there was another guy on Star City. Uh, he played it at a Star City Open, mm -hmm. but he ended up referencing me finally. But it's yeah, it's fine. I don't. I I'm not one of those that I have to be referenced. If people are actually, and and the, the, he could have. Uh, some other people could come up with the same idea at the same time. Um, one of the beefs I did have with Star City. I know one of their art. The, one of their writers does must follow my channel because right after I put out a video series, he always you know puts it out. But it was the exact same deck list that was on the Star City. I mean, to a T, and it was only playing two Snapcaster Mages. And the only reason there was two Snapcaster Mages in the deck is because I was poor and couldn't afford two more <laughs> Snapcasters. <laughs> so that's why I know it was my brew, because there was no reason not to run a full play, play set of the best card. And Snapcaster was. It was hands down the best card in the, the deck. And when I did finally pick up the, the remaining two Snapcasters, it worked out a lot better. So I mean, it's just nice when they give you, you know, they give you some credit. But it's, I just like to see something that I've, I've brewed out there. I don't, I don't necessarily need to have the the praise. I'm yeah. looking at the the, fir uh, the first Google hit on the deck, and it has two snapcast images on TCG player. Yeah, it, it, it's a coincidence. <laughs> they just had the same idea at the same time and exactly the same deck list. <laughs> yeah, and they only had two snapcast images. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe they were exactly poor like me, too. <laughs> that explains it. See? There you go. Logical explanation right there. He was poor. Poor city, Star City Games guy. Uh, I find it very important to credit the brewers. I, I go to great lengths to try to credit brewers. And uh, uh, especially when I play a deck a lot on YouTube and people think it's my deck. I'm sort of pointed out in all the show notes and in the video <laughs> that it's not... Yeah, I was about to say that because you always, uh, you know, you always mention uh, like uh, GPH Snake or uh, Turbo Kitty or you know whoever brewed the deck. You always have that attention to to mention who it was and where they can follow up on on their stuff. So that's really important. Yeah, I think the brewers. the brewers are doing great work, and that's one of the few things they get back is the credit. So it's it's really important. Exactly. Um. <clears throat> Now, uh, just one last thing about net decking. Um, I have this opinion, I don't know if you're going to share in it, but um, that net decks are probably caused by the money involved nowadays in, in pro magic. You know, there's more, uh, more of a streamlining because of the professionalism involved, uh, which is growing uh, exponentially. So do you, do you think that also influences a Person choice of, uh, you know, risking uh, playing a rogue deck or going for a sure thing. 
Well, that's a huge thing. I mean, especially like, this PTQ entry fee was 25 bucks. Um, and then the price support is, is pretty terrible for the 25. So with, you know, 200 people paying 25 bucks, that's $5,000 going into the, the tournament. And the, the, the flight ticket is just to Atlanta. Atlanta is one of the, the cheapest flights you can get here in the States. So it's not going to cost Wizards uh, very much to pay for that, that plane ticket. And the prize was still meh. So I'm thinking that the, the people, when they go into a tournament like that, that it is higher stakes, like a, PT, a Pro Tour invite is on the line. They want something that are statistically shown to work. And I, I understand that drive. Like I, there was one of the guys that went with us that he, he usually plays a variety of different decks. Both of them, actually two of the guys that, that went with us, they, at f and they run a huge variety, but they went with mono blue and mono black because the stats were there and they didn't want to risk it. And I see, I made a risky call here. I, I, I played a deck that was untested, didn't test it much, and no holes in the deck. And but it did pay off at the PTQ before then when I played Soul Sisters, and no one was prepared for it. And it was just perfect with against the the, the meta game at the time was mostly was lingering Jund. That was the flavor of Jund. The you know Jund has changed so much in the the past year or two, uh, and and at the time it was. Their splash was white for Lingering Souls, and I believe there was like one or two other cards. They like to put Stony Silence in it for because Tron was a bad, bad matchup for it. And there was a few, I think Elspeth was the other card that they put in, the old Elspeth Knight, um, the Knight one. And uh, yeah, and so Soul Sisters was so perfectly prepared to just uh, run over UWR Control and uh, Jund, and it was it was. I did. I ba- I lost my first match, drew my second match, and was able to then play basically UWR or Jun variants the rest of the way up, and pretty much get a lot of auto wins that way. And it was it was just by playing a and it's also just at the time was pretty rogue. It, not not very many people played it, especially the version that I ran with the Arc Champions. Mm-hmm. So it pays off to be creative and and you know kind of go. Conley Woods does very well with his crazy mm-hmm. brews. And and that's that's I think if more people played like if everyone played we'll we'll just use Bug Immortal Servitude, uh, I think that if people played that deck as much as say Mono Blue Devotion would be playing now, I think you would have seen some top finishes just by if you would see all the zero fives or uh, that's why I'm so glad that MTG Goldfish is now recording um, the the zero and fives and 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 one and fours and. Two and three, so you get to see now. If you click on Mono Blue Devotion, you get to see all of them that failed in that tournament. So one maybe did win, but there was tons of them that went zero and five. Yeah. So it gets you a gives you a better perspective. Uh, well, read on that this deck isn't just going to a tournament and auto winning. It's going to a tournament and there's as many losing as there's is winning. Yeah. And and oftentimes the when the like when you say when like the, when the meta game is not prepared for a certain deck, um, it can be really hard for the the, the standard decks to uh, to uh, sideboard something against it. I remember Stanislav Sivka winning. I can't remember the tournament, but with eggs, nobody was expecting eggs, and he just destroyed everybody. Yeah, it's a pro tour, and eggs is the easiest deck in the world to shut down. Yeah. And they, yeah, exactly. No one was prepared for it. That's 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 the the value of a, of a rogue deck because if they don't know what you're running or what your deck is supposed to do, then they don't have no clue how to sideboard uh, against it. That was the best with Bug Immortal Servitude is they'd side in a bunch of removal. I'm like, why in the world are you bring an abrupt decays in versus me? <laughs> I want you to put my my uh, elvish mist or elvish uh, uh whatever cantrip guy in the graveyard. That's where I want him to be. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're taking out blood artists and one. I'm like, eh, I'll get them back. <laughs> uh, Dan, uh, your thoughts? On? The uh, streamlining of, uh, of net decks because of the money involved in Magic now? I think uh, it has been going on since uh, the dojo, since <laughs> <laughs> Magic got a lot of publicity on the early internet the early World Wide Web. Uh, I think we have to take a step back here and look at the brilliance of the design of Magic the Gathering as a game. Uh, because of the sideboard structure as well, it is a bit self-regulating. So 
if everybody plays a certain net deck, yeah. it's usually standard is a is a format where it can sometimes go south, but in other formats, it's sort of it reg they regulate themselves with the, the the sort of mechanic of the game. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. That uh, net decking is uh, you can get some of the way by net decking, but you can't really go all the way. You have to make the great meta game calls, make the right sideboard choices, mm -hmm. and uh, do the unexpected to to yeah. be the final winner. Yeah, exactly. Like do exactly the same decks will perform differently in the same matchup depending on their sideboard uh, sideboarding strategies. Yep. Yeah, and a lot of rogue decks end up becoming net decks too. I mean, that's the and then and that's another beef I have with a lot of the more competitive players. The you know the the personalities I like to call it you know the spike personality is they um, they have no idea why certain decks won a certain tournament. One that comes to mind is the the aristocrats, mm -hmm. and it had success at one pro tour. And the reason why it had so much success is that they Sam Black specifically beat that to beat the UWR matchup, and it did. It just rolled over it, and and that's what everyone was playing. I mean, he knew that that's basically what most of the, the other players were going to come in with or, or variants that the aristocrats. And then like a week later, you know, people have sideboarded against aristocrats and now it wasn't getting the finishes that it used to get. And even like Mono Blue, Mono Blue was the same thing. That was kind of an unheard of deck at the time. You saw a few decks on, on MTGO, but they weren't performing very well on MTGO, the Mono Blue Devotions. And then as soon as it won that Pro Tour, everyone was playing it. And now again, like I said, I, I think the only reason that Mono Blue is is continuing to get top eight is just the sheer number of people that are running it. Yeah, they're running the odds definitely because I don't even think that's that's it's such a strong deck to be honest. It, it's it, easy to shut down. It's it the is. same thing. If if you know how to play against it, you just take out the Night Vale Specters and the Master of Waves. Like that one of the guys that went with us to uh, uh, Fort Collins, he basically said that his Master of Waves did absolutely nothing the entire match because people just now waited for it killed the master waves and yeah, yeah. And you just spent four mana on nothing just run those lightning strikes against the night fill specters and some like trickeries and it will be fine <laughs> um dan you actually played that weird deck that i brewed the uh is it yes one? yeah um, it didn't perform yeah. quite as well as it performed for me but you have to admit it must have been fun to catch the desecration demon yes <laughs> that was fun <laughs> okay so that's a big flyer you have can i borrow it for a while <laughs> that's the, that's why i brewed it because you know they, they usually run one big threat or two big threats and if you can just catch it's too bad you can't really use the release part of it but as long as you can catch it it's like oh hey nice <laughs> nice yeah. planeswalker you got there. Can I borrow it? <laughs> Make some tokens. <laughs> I, I have to share an ancient magic story with you guys. I was at uh, uh, playing at the, the 95 World Championships, and we um, sort of uh, it was at night between uh, two uh, between two days of playing, and I was still in the competition. And we were sitting with some Americans and uh, we were having drinks. And I actually learned that this American thing with the paper bag is real, that you had to have a paper bag over your bottle if you went outside. Mm -hmm. Or otherwise you could end up in trouble. But anyway, we were really drunk and we were sitting playing with uh, Power Nine <laughs> uh, without sleeves oh, man. on a table uh, against some randoms. And one guy was running... Uh, he only had control magic effects in his deck. <laughs> and everyone was really drunk. And he was like, say, that's a nice uh, something you have over there. Can I borrow it? <laughs> so all he ever did was take people's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we call it borrowing. <laughs> yeah, and it was all this like unsleeved Power 9 stuff. You know, <laughs> sleazy table with like beer stains. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I've never even great. seen a Power Knight, to be honest, any of it. <laughs> oh, I've sold a couple of sets of Power Knights oh, <laughs> during wow. my days. I think I own three Be Beta Lotus sets, but all I have now is uh, one Mox. That's what I kept. 
Oh, is that all? You poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of the power things. But I, I thought I was... I sort of played a lot of uh, paper uh, until 97, uh, very competitively. I was ranked 13 in the world at the time. And uh, so, I, but I got out at 97, I sort of finished university and had to start working. So I sold most of my expensive stuff at the time. But I kept like some crap. I had a um, lionized diamond, <laughs> a couple of <laughs> pile of mint ones, like, oh, this is worth nothing. Let's put it in a shelf. And, um, just, just use it to... So I, mean, I found it, like, nice. <laughs> just I just remember... Those were like 25 cents or something when I, <laughs> when I got them. I had a friend eat a lion's eye diamond. He was so mad that he opened it back in Mirage when we were we were little kids at the time. And he was so mad that he opened a lion's eye diamond because it was at the time we couldn't figure out a uh, use for it, and he no, ate couldn't. it. Now, but, but, yeah, dredge have to be invented before there was ever use for it. Yeah, I I don't even I don't remember much of a use even. Well, then again, I wasn't very competitive back then. In fact, our play group was destroyed because one of the players became very competitive and. He started the first net decking in our playgroup, but yeah, that's we couldn't find a fit. We couldn't find a use, and that's when like Inquest and Scry existed, not the internet. I mean, the internet <laughs> existed, but no one used it at the time. So it's Inquest. We had to wait for our Inquest, and now I remember. I remember going in the basement and finding an old Inquest magazine, looking about how terrible those decks were that they brewed on <laughs> Inquest. Yeah, they were crazy bad. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first number of Scry, where uh, the first issue of Scry, where they sort of tried to guess what cards there were in Magic. <laughs> <laughs> because Wizards hadn't released the information. So nobody really knew the exact number and names of the cards. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to Born of the Gods, the next set. Um, so the new mechanics, of course, the inspired mechanic, tapping and untapping your cards to gain a benefit from it, that's gonna work so well with heroic. Everything works well with heroic if you look at it. I mean, bestow, uh, even tribute. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the cards that was spoiled so far? There's like 54 spoiled, I believe, so far. Yeah, that's right. So, what are your thoughts? What cards stand out uh, to you guys? I understand why they put spring leaf drum in it, but <laughs> when you saw it spoiled, it was like, what? The, why is spring leaf drum in that set? But now you understand. <laughs> I just got my first uh, set of spring leaf drums, the original ones, uh, like three weeks ago, and now they're re-releasing it. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> I had to special order it from the U.S. All um, right. <laughs> uh, Kevin, thoughts on the spoiled card so far and mechanics? Yeah, I, I'm I'm liking this set a lot. Most of the powerful cards are in the uncommon uh, range, so I don't know how expensive this set. Hopefully, it doesn't end up like another Dragon's Maze with no value in it, and then people don't want to open it. But uh, I, I my favorite card so far is just the three mana. The three he's one red, one green, and one colorless for the tribute one. And if you don't tribute him, he becomes a four four haster. And he still has trample. And then if you do tribute him, he's a four-four trample. I think that's incredibly powerful uh, in the because the tribute. I don't like cards that give the opponent the option. Like the Phoenix is the card that everyone's talking about, and I really just see it as it's going to be the worst of two. Either they're going to they're going to have something that can deal with the three-three hates flyer, or they're going to have a removal for the five-five flyer for four. So neither one of them is too impressive in standard right now. I mean, both both get answered by a desecration demon. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a five of fire is good for four mana, but it's it's nothing like so special that we haven't seen so far. We already have the six six flyer for four, but the, so the option always giving your option the opponent option is is a bad choice in a card. Uh, everyone was so hyped about vexing devil, and we saw how that turned out. It was neither one of those scenarios. It, it was always the the worst scenario for you. If you needed the four damage, it's going to be a four three creature. You needed a four three creature, it's going to be four damage. It's a it's a card with a built in dismember to it. So, and then, so some of these tributes kind of feel that way too, but this one, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's, the tribute is so ne negligible that a 3-3 three, three trample for three is, is decent by itself. 
a four four trample is great, and a and a four four or plus one plus one three three haster until in a uh, until in a turn is great too. And I think it's it's the missing piece for RG Aggro. They need like a three drop that you know can go first turn Elvish Mystic into. Now you have uh, two choices. You actually have three choices between Boon Seder, Domri, and and this dude. So I'm really liking that card. I think it's gonna be the most impactful besides the obvious choices like the. The new infest and the, the negative three, negative three instant speed removal. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think we might see a resurgence of the RG aggro, uh, maybe reaching the, the top four. I don't know how. Yeah, it still works like, great. You know. Did it go away? Well, no, oh, it's, it's RG there, monsters. But... Yeah, it's yeah. not really the same thing. It's way more mid ranged mm -hmm. than what they're trying to do. Is it's just another devotion deck that tries to spit out as much mana as possible. What we need uh, is RG aggro would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no Flint and Four to get the Burning Tree, Burning Tree, Flint and Four nonsense. Uh, I, uh, I hated those decks. Yep. <laughs> they always had <laughs> them in the hand, no, always. <laughs> always, I, I, there I was, just trying to build my little army, and there they go, Burning Tree into Burning Tree into Burning Tree into Flint and Four. Uh, thanks. <laughs> that, that actually happened to me at, at GP, uh, or not GP, at this, this last PTQ. Against RG Monsters, as I having went Burning Tree into Burning Tree into Burning Tree, I'm like, ah, <laughs> I guess I lose this match. <laughs> yeah, because there's really nothing you can do to recover from that. You'd have to have an insane amount of removal in your hand. Like, yep. Yeah, you yeah, lightning yeah, strike, lightning strike to lightning strike. <laughs> That's still too it. slow, because then what, what he did is actually Burning Tree, Burning Tree, Burning Tree into Sylvan Carotid, and then next turn he threw out a Paul Kronos, and then he proceeded to top deck into. Monster, monster, monster. So it's I was dealing with the monsters. I was killing the the, the bosses and the the, but it was just the the six damage each turn that I wasn't able to. And I had like locks and in smiters in my hand that I couldn't cast, or otherwise I'm just dead to these huge monsters. That so yeah. Yeah, don't you just love cantrips? Yeah, not a, not a fan of burning tree emissary because when I play it, I, it's like burning tree emissary into oh I got nothing with it. I, yeah, I know. It's when when I play, it's like I have Burning Tree Emissary and an Ash Zealot. What am I gonna do here? Yeah, yeah I know exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, I played it too, too, I guess. And there goes my mana. At least we don't have any more mana burn. Uh, it, it's great if you don't like consistency with your deck. You want you want it to be a different experience every time. I played that deck <laughs> deck a lot, and uh, when it worked, you felt like a genius. But then you have those draws as well. Yeah. When you didn't. I mean, all decks are, you know, all decks work like that, but I don't know why they seem to work a lot better for my opponents than <laughs> for me. It's just, it's unfair, that's what it is. That's because you remember the bad experience. <laughs> that's true. Um, so, good news for your Underworld Cerberus, Kevin, we have multicolored gods now, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm really liking the... I actually like Mogus. I mm. think he's... He feels to me like in a, people. I, I I actually like him in more of a control deck. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of assemble legions, I don't know if that's because he he still threatens. Even like if you had like a Chandra and you somehow put out something else that adds the devotion up to to seven, you have a seven powered beater that can just end the game. But it really feels like in assemble legions that it's going to get two damage if you're in a control deck. It's going to get two damage per turn. Uh, and then just basically grind out your opponent. And Xenagos is kind of cool as well. I've already brewed some scenarios that you can actually get Xenagos active on himself, and so he's basically, you have to look at him as a 12-11 uh, haster uh, the turn he comes into play, because you can go Burning Tremissary into the um, the human guy, that the one that does damage, taps for green, and does uh, damage every time. It, so time then, time. yeah, so if you have like an Elvish Mystic out, then the your Xenagos is active on turn three, which is, that's that's a pretty aggressive, of course, you you have to have that god hand, but I mean, that's just two cards, really, that you have to synergize. You could have any one drop, you could have a Drive Militant, you could have an Elvish Mystic, you could have an Experiment One, and so there's there's plenty of one drops into your Burning Tree, into your Zerta Druid, into your Xenagos. So I'm thinking that scenario will work out quite a bit, and Unworld Cerberus, I, or Cerberus will still get its its day in the sun, I think. It's, it's a very powerful card. I've had a lot of success with it. And it's... I think that the biggest problem with it not seeing much play is Stormbreath Dragon exists. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're competing for that, that same slot. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
I'm ho I'm still hoping Rakdos control is gonna be a thing soon. I I, I just want a Rakdos control deck. <laughs> uh, it just I I have tried to brood it, but I I I just can't seem to to make it work. Yeah, I, I'm with you. It's just I think the temples are gonna help that deck out a lot. Actually, I mean, just something is as simple as that. Temples are actually a lot better than I had anticipated. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree. I just looked at him as like, what? Why are they so much better than the Guildgate? Yeah, he's Cry one, but it still comes in into play tapped. Uh, but the Cry ability is just, it's it's really good. Uh, it, it can save you a turn effectively. So. Uh, yeah. Are we getting uh, all the five temples now? Uh, yeah, we're gonna get the. Uh, so why are they only spoiling three so far? No, we're not getting all five of them. It's just going to be the allied. The reason for that is what I heard is that the um, they printed the in the first in Theros the 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 dragon's maze or sorry gate crash. All the gate yeah. crash lands were printed in in Theros. And they did that for a reason because they felt the gate crash lands didn't get as much time in the yes. return to Ravnica block, so they thought they'd give those and then. And for this set, they're just going to do the allied, the remaining allied colors, and then the last set, they're just going to have the Golgari and the Is it, which were, uh, again, were were Ravnica dual lands. Oh no! And so yeah, was my Is it brew? I'm going to have to wait a couple yeah, more. Yeah, apparently there's no room for them. So if you look at the numbers on, there's no there's no more slots for two more lands. Okay. So that's all we're going to get. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to Is It too, and it, it see Scry works the best in Is It, I, in my yeah, opinion. Exactly. That's the one that wants it because mm -hmm. it sets up like I, I'm I'm fiddling around with an Ivic Cyclops deck again because mm -hmm. it's just it's so much fun to especially like an F and M deck. It's it's very fun to play. Uh, we're having a lot, and it's it's a it's a cheap deck too. So I I I built it for a couple of the kids locally, uh, as it's just it doesn't really cost anything if you you don't you don't have to have. The dual lands you can you can get by with is it guild gates right now and then it's it's all you can you can make a competitive deck with all com commons and uncommons just using um nivix and then oh i guess quicken you need quicken is your only rare mm. and then armed armed and dangerous is an uncommon and it, it it's actually pretty consistent with teleportal armed and dangerous quicken you can get off that one turn kill and whatnot but a scry land would make that deck so much better because you could set up that card you're drawing so you could keep a lot, a lot worse hands, and and still pull out of it just from a scry. You see that? I told you it was good. That's pretty much what yeah. I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A Crone close. Crusader, Young Pyromancer, uh, included in there, and catch release to catch their big threats. And, uh, yeah, some some removal. Uh, I. Uh, yeah, that's because uh, Nivik Cyclops is just such a good card. You teleport a lot up and armed and dangerous, well, like the only tap. Uh, especially if you have museum skin in hand. Um, so let's do a, just a little bit of speculation before you wrap it up. Um, top three specs or price increases that you predict uh, after Born of the Gods hits. Uh, let's start with Dan. Well, uh, first of, uh, I think. Many people that do magic finance are way too short-sighted, and uh, that this kind of speculation uh, to speculate on short-term standard cards is uh, doomed. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much, it's very, very hard to do, and it's very. Uh, I only work on magic online for specs, and uh, the rake, uh, the amount you have to pay bots to sell cards will in the long run kill any profit you make by short-term specs. You will remember your successes and you will think that, ah, you are so good at speculating. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I do, I spend about 80% of my magic time doing finance. And uh, I really try to stay away from this, this kind of speculation because it's not. Um, and there are many reasons why it's not. Uh, but rather you have to work on the uh, on the greater trends on Magic Online, because they are, are buy modern cards when nobody wants modern 
course, in GTQ season. Mm-hmm. And you look at instrument. What I would do here is, uh, and what seems to be really pure speculation, <laughs> um, but at that time, it happened in, in theoretical standard. Uh, um, master waves, uh, uh, those are great. But uh, uh, I'm really not looking at uh, getting into doing any short term spec uh, because of what, what so you're more of a modern speculator. Which the two small ups. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, a lot of standard speculation as well. But I do it on, on the, for example, uh, oil will be at its lowest price in mid-June hmm. and its highest price in February 2015. So if you just buy look, all three expansions, mid you sell in the mid-February, you will will make if you just stay on the playable cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, despite what the X so I think that's more much more sustainable. <laughs> yeah. and uh, we don't know the starting price just for the cards themselves is hard to speculate on. Yeah that's true. So uh, sorry for not giving you a real no, answer. No, no, no. <laughs> it's 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 fine. Um, <clears throat> I'll just um Put you here on my band from the show list. No, just kidding. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Avoided issues. <laughs> um, Kevin, uh, you on the me? other hand, I'd like to add. Uh, <laughs> Go on. Nicole. Hello. Call from Boston. I, I oh, there you are. Trying to push a white weenie strategy. I lost you there for a second. King or Respos. Hello? Oh, there you are. Ah. You, you were okay. gone for a second on my yes. end. So, oh. I'm, I'm still getting... When? You're still cutting away a lot now. For some reason. Skype. It's wonderful. Yeah, the wonderful world of Skype. Uh, it was doing uh, so well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't, hello. I, I can't hear anything you're saying. I heard you say hello. Oh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> welcome, oh, we're, welcome we're back to the show. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll edit. I'll edit in an interlude over here. No problem. Not really. I don't have the budget for it. Um. So, Kevin, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, great. At least we can hear you. Um. Any speculations on your end? Well, I, I like to work with what knowledge we have, like what can. And, like, and I think that everyone was a little bit short-sighted on how played a role in standard. Like Master Waves was, of, of course, first one, uh, very cheap. You could have bought it into Master Waves. And then you could... Because oh, that set has been, I think it's the PTQs that really mm-hmm. killed Theros. I mean, I worked that much. They're holding high priority. I think that we've kind of leveled out in Magic. We haven't seen the huge increase in Strad cards when Return to Ravnica. It's just that all players, I think that. Come on. So nine million at the start of Return Ravnica, and now we're up to twelve players, active players from Magic the Gathering, so crippled. Since now we have seen Theros taper off in growth. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is called RPT. That's all APT. So I mean, there still is some growth that we have as far as what can go up, because I like it right now. Sure, it's not, not as a because it's eternally, you can have eternal 
just in the casual crowd. It's one of the uh, one of the more very popular and casual of those. And, and what I thought is it could have. If, if we do see some more spoiled cards that do use the double devotion uh, to. Uh, we have a shitty card to read besides colors of devotion. But if we do see something like a green uh, of, of trusty card like that skyrock um if on screech uh three three head x four mana isn't isn't bad at plot, plot remove it, it ox or any other devotion card at acting a dual devotion mm-hmm. and it's just that's just bull rare so if you want to look at things that can't actually be worth your speculation because there's a speculating for every right you're going to get like four wrong mm-hmm. so I don't like to really it can go down in value I, I want to <clears throat> buy in that especially admit it tend to go up in just because of redemption mm-hmm. so I mean even if it, a ton of council laps when they were going for 30, 30, 30 tickets. It's low for a car you needed to redeem a set. And they have bounced up a little bit, but I mean, it's not, not it's profits. But again, I, I, I put Dan on, uh, on the spec. Right now are definitely modern cards. We, we've already seen some move on a lot of them, but we're going to be coming in in, in June. And one of the reasons why standing up in value right now are being opened at an insanely rate as they were during this sealed not standard. So there's actually for standard cards, and people are trying to play test all the their PT standard decks and all they sets for those. So our turn to see standard cards go up in value. I think it is about February. Is the peak parts before they start to to, to fall, out, especially like the Return to Ravnica type stuff, because he early rotating cards, and that should be about February, March this year. So, Ravnica cards that aren't going to see immediate because of some sort of new mechanic in Born of the God, the only thing they can enable uh, dual devotion, or if, if you if you tear deck. They have been colors that have been avoided, like Rakdos colors, or uh, uh, it, oh, we haven't seen so far. Man, could, could skyrocket in value. It's a great spec, but the numbers are still low right now. You still have, you can, you can still have very low, and they're in, they're in a, a ton of different modern decks. So I, I thought, what's a safe investment? The only thing that pod go up, on, on, like Karn start to go up, Liliana start to go up, are going up, looking at the, the not so obvious staples, like Inkwalt Net, Nexus is a, a huge one. Is, and I, I know the Masters cards are definitely uh, going to start as well. So I, I, I don't know if that's, that's a quick Born of the Gods, how it's going to affect because I haven't a clue. Uh, so impressed with a lot of... I think that Mono Black is going to get better. Probably. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's, speculation's a, a very tricky field right now, especially from the new guy... A lot of new lot, speculators are really market more than anything. It's 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 creating a that isn't justified in a lot of these cards. Like you'll see, like certain groups are tar- targeting ones, and it's just spiking the value. Like, Consecrated Sphinx is one that I they went from six to twenty overnight, and there really isn't any demand for that except for commanders. It might be in a bubble. I'm. I am definitely worried about a magic bubble, right? Hmm. Yeah, don't enjoy it, Mom.
So I cut out. Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, I could, but right now I. It kind of fell apart. Call. Oh, Dan. Dan is having some technical issues. Okay. There we go. We're back. We had some technical difficulties. Well, Dan did. But, um, well, I have, uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned the Ink Moth Nexus because I, I watched your speculation video like a year ago. I, I'm still holding on to those. I, I still have those. So I'm hoping that they go up in price now and I can get rid of a couple. Um, also, I have a Rakdos and Opsidats, which I hope... Dual devotion is actually going to be a thing, and I can ship those away because I can't really build a deck around them. Um, so yeah, I think we discussed uh, all the topics that I had on my cheat sheet over here. So, um, any closing statements? I have a couple of uh, finance calls. I have a couple of finance calls mm -hmm. right now. And uh, Kevin. I think uh, the most important part about uh, Standard is that rotation will probably hit a lot earlier this year because Standard PDQ season has moved. And when it ends on March 9th, I am looking to not own any uh, RTR book cards on Magic Online. So I'm selling out everything during February. Of course, if you want to play Standard, uh, you're paying for that. But... Uh, I don't expect generally the value of Return to Ravnica Gate Crash and Dragon's Maze uh, will decline steadily from March 9 onwards. Yeah, I'm with you there. Completely with you there. That's that's definitely going to... Yeah, the, the whole moving it for sealed PTQ, I don't know if that was a good move. Because, I mean, yeah, usually right now... Like last year right now was Modern and then Standard... That was the, yeah. yeah, and so now they've messed with that, so, yeah. But they have to fit in the extra Pro Tour, and I, uh, I think... With you, I think that the, everyone's going to be trying to get out of Return to Ravnica a lot earlier. Yeah, yeah, that is... Yes. Yeah. So if you don't need the cards from Return to Ravnica, I don't think it's worth it to try to speculate on uh, Journey to Nick. It's like, the cards, yeah, we'd be getting the enemy colored gods, and of course some of those... Like you said, Opsidot or is it colored stuff could spike, but it's not worth the risk when people are just going to be getting out of stand. I'm not totally waiting on, on a ship, but I'm at, we're probably going to get rid of all of our Return to Ravnica inventory uh, towards the, the end of using the Yeah. Uh, also, there's a lot of modern spikes lately, so. Any card that have gone up 200% or more on Magic Online in modern, I would get rid of now. And I would especially get rid of the cards that's being flashback drafted in the next few. Uh, Dan, you cut out a way a little bit over there, at least for me. Will uh, be pretty profitable. Are you back? You talking to me or talking to Dan? Dan, <laughs> he's okay, gone. Did you hear anything? Oh, there you are. No, I just get out the the little bit. Okay. The last ten seconds or so. So it's it's fine. Did you hear about the fetch lamps? Uh, no. Are they are they doing Zednikar drafts? Is that it? The flashback yes. drafts. That's oh. where you stopped. Okay. So yeah. uh, I would sell uh, fetch, uh, sell Zednikar fetch lamps right now and buy them in two hey. weeks. That is, that's, that's, all, that's definitely what I'll do. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's definitely that's something that MTG Online is. You have to, you have to, you have to keep up with those. And again, yes. one other thing is you you're gonna if you're a speculator, once those event decks are spoiled, get rid of those cards immediately because that is it. Mark Rosen. Water already said that those are not limited print runs. They're unlimited. They'll, they'll keep printing them as long as there's demand. So just like Commander. And if you've seen how bad the Commander has hurt prices.
think the Shrunky is a contender, and anything else in those decks is just bottomed out because that was not a limited print run either. And so these modern event decks, I, I guess we should explain it. You, you know what I'm talking about, Dan, right? Yes. The so is there two of them or just one of them? Because I've heard two That's different. One. Is there just one? Okay. Yes. So whatever's in that deck, then get rid of. And, and people are already thinking it's going to be Pod. I think it's probably going to be either Affinity or Murphal. That, that's my that's my guess. But it, it could be Jund. I mean, and they could print a Jund deck and you know have like Liliana in, in there for seventy five bucks. It's going to have a, a lot of good stuff in it. I wouldn't be surprised if a couple Mythics aren't included in a couple fetch lands. So. Are- they, they count the rares and the mythics, so maybe they have double the amount uh, usually. So maybe two mythics yeah. and twelve rares, and you can build no young deck from that. Yep. So like that's going to kill those prices. Just from uh, the eight of the tokens. Oh, that you broke up there. What, what was your? <laughs> I heard you say tokens, and then you were gone. Yeah. Yes, uh, the A team gets the uh, Black Pirate tokens, and I think you we could... will see a deck uh, that is in the one hundred fifty to two hundred fifty dollar price range. The thing with Black White tokens, though, is it's very it's like tier three. You, you rarely ever see Black White tokens in today's I modern. I mean, I could see How UWR. How competitive have the standard event deck, event decks been? The, the, but the, the difference between standard event decks is, well, the value of them for sure. Like the last one was pretty good. It, it, it had the actually Theros one wasn't that great, but the the one before it was was pretty good. With you know, it was loaded with at least experiments, burning tremissaries. But I mean, they've been decently, but. Yeah, I guess black white tokens have again. You know, I think I think. See, my guess is fish or 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 like a, a cheaper affinity. I don't know if they'll even be that brazen to reprint fetch lands. I'm I'm still under the the group that I think that M15 is going to see some fetch lands. I think they're going to give us the death right sh- common fetch lands and standard just for a couple months so we can all just the good old days when we had access to both ponder and preordain. They, oh, wow. They did that, so why can't I mean, why can't they put Fetchlands and and Deathrite? Sean, you can still use it in Delver. Oh, man. and I'm thinking that M15 is gonna have some fetches in it. That's, they need to reprint them. Very likely. I hope so. So, so I'm thinking maybe the modern event deck is just gonna be a monocolor type thing. I, don't know, I could even see Living End be the modern deck, or or some, or even Tron, something like that. Tron would be a very easy one to put in event event deck. Because you can put a bunch of subpar Tron targets like Platinum Angel or uh, Sundering Titan or, yeah, just Mind Slavers, that type. You wouldn't have to go the, the whole Worm Coil, Karn Liberated route in the event deck. It could be kind of a, a toned down Tron. Yeah, if you add Karn in an event deck, that would be insane. Well, they, they probably will. I, I'm, I'm thinking there's going to be a $50 Mythic really? in the event deck. Yeah, well, they used, we saw it with the last seventy-five dollar product. They printed Jace the Mind Sculptor in it, True. so they they've they've shown that they will. Uh, They're not afraid. <laughs> you're pretty, yes, that was just Soul Sisters are great. Would have. Uh, It'll kill the prices. The Soul Sister. Cards. So that that deck finally got above the two hundred dollar mark. It took forever, <laughs> and it's more yeah. commander that was driving the price of it. Is the commander that was uh, bringing up the price of the Sarah's uh, Ascendant, yeah. Sarah Ascendant, and as well as more Pod that was bringing up the price of Ranger Vios. So I wouldn't even say that Soul Sister is the cause for Soul Sister deck going up. <laughs> yeah, Sarah Ascendant in in commander is just cheating. Oh look, a turn one six six lifelink yeah. flyer. Hi. <laughs> Deal with that. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, uh, any more uh, final thoughts before we wrap it up? I'm good. <laughs> 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 no.
Now that we can hear you, Dan, please. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should take the opportunity and say something. You were not in this show. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was horrible. We heard nothing you said. No, I'm kidding. It was just a couple of parts. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I guess uh, it's a show. Um, thank you guys a lot for uh, for doing it. Um, I hope it wasn't boring or anything. Uh, and I, I hope to have you guys on for uh, future episodes if you know, if the people like it. <laughs> uh, oh, this was fun. All right. Well. Yeah, I I really gave you a sub to there, Dan. On I didn't even didn't even uh, know your channel existed. I play some some what you, some popper heirloom. Is that what the format was? No, that's two different formats. Dan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> what is <you> terrible? <laughs> well, this okay. this recording I've done on my end will be terrible. <laughs> we'll uh we'll consolidate our resources. It, it will be fine. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, on on a positive note, my computer is still not on fire. So, hey, maybe the recording over here will be good. <laughs> Kevin yeah, was saying he saying subscribed you to your tribes. channel. I don't know if you heard that. Dan. And he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Off on the journey to nowhere. Were you exiled, Dan? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most hilarious thing I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Google Hangout. All right, well, episode two is going to be on Google Hangout, then. <laughs> we'll try that out as soon as I figure out what it is. Yeah, it's, a, it's somewhat better audio-wise. We'll give that a whirl then for episode two. Um, so <laughs> hopefully we'll have more of Dan. <laughs> oh, I'm still laughing. <laughs> uh, I should end this episode. Okay, so uh, thank you again for uh, for coming along on this crazy ride filled with audio problems, and uh, thank you. <laughs> hopefully we'll see you on the next roadcast. See you guys. Take care. Cheers.